Good evening. There we go. Oh, thank you. Let's just pray. I think prayer is a good idea. Like it's a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> Father, help us. God, help us. God, help us. <laughs> you getting it? Come on. Like, that is the door that's in the floor. When you acknowledge, I'm so far from the authentic blueprint. It's called the delet. It's the fourth letter. And the delet, the letter delet, is the posture of someone bending in the tent door. It's humility. And when Moses would encounter God, they'd go to their tent doors and they would bend down. That was the delet. The delet looks to the gimel. The gimel is the full supply of his house. To have the full supply of his house, you have to have a posture of the dal. The dal, the dalet, means the poor man who of himself has nothing. When we become the delet, the dal, we access the gimel. This is the logic of ascension. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Father. Do we pray? Yeah, we did. We did, and we. God help us. Let's pray it one more time. God help us. What a terrible mess we're in. <laughs> it's time for a generation to repent, and repentance is. A sustained change of thinking about how reality functions. Repentance is a sustained change of thinking about the nature of reality. So we need to repent, which means return to the pent up. The gimbal is the pent up. It's the, it's the bursting supply of heaven. So repentance means return to the bursting supply. Pent up. So we need to go back, return. It's interesting that it's got the word re, which means it's where we came from. Because you can only return to somewhere you've come from. So repentance means to return to your authentic origin. So in the last days, many will say, let's go to Isaiah 2, 2, 2. It says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be the highest of all mountains. It will be raised higher than the hills, and there will be a steady stream of people going there. Many people shall say, come. Oh, and let us go up. Into. In. Into the mountain of the Lord, to the house oh, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the word into all of the earth. So we need to go back to where we came from. And scripture says that you were born from Zion. So going to Zion seems to be a good idea. Right. I want to tell you the secret of ascension so that it becomes a natural process for you. And I'm going to tell you how ascension works through the logic of the Hebrew. Because encoded in the Hebrew is higher dimensional thinking. So the, the English alphabet, A, B, C, doesn't mean a thing. But Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Delet mean a lot. The beings, they're like universes in their own rights. They've got houses in the heavens. And they interface with you to teach you about the oneness and the flame of Yahweh. Okay? Now the word, come, let us go up. The word go up, which we get the word ascend from, is a Hebrew word called Allah which I find kind of funny. Because yeah. it's like they're all going, Allah! And God's saying, yeah, come up. So it's made up of Hebrew letters. Here we go. We're going to get into some Hebrew a second. It's got the Ayin, which is like a kind of Y. The Lamed, which is the highest letter. And the He. He. 
okay? It's made up of these three letters, and encoded in these letters is the technology of ascension. The word itself means to restore or to recover or to burn up. So the word ascend, Allah, has the idea that you are being burnt up. Why is that important? Because the flame of his desire, if you step into it, changes you into particle. I'll say it again. What does a flame do to matter? It reconfigures it. It transfigures it. Ascension, which means going up, is transfiguration technology. So to a Hebrew, when it says present yourself as a living sacrifice, it isn't how we've interpreted it in the West. In the West, it's like, oh, I'm presenting myself, I'm working it, I'm doing this. To a Hebrew, it means you surrender to his desire for you, and you are consumed, and you become light, fragrance, cloud, and you expand beyond your body. So the idea of ascension is that you expand beyond your body. Because the body's consumed and what's released is light, life, energy, heat, fire, passion, fire and glory. So the first letter is called Ayin. I'm sorry this is so small and you guys can't all see it. Forgive me. Ayin. And the symbol, every letter in Hebrew has a symbol. And the symbol for Ayin is an I. To put it another way, what you look at, you'll go to. So it says, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Why do people not go to heaven? They don't look upwards. Where you look, you'll go. The idea is to look, to see, to understand, to experience. It means to appear there. And every letter in Hebrew has a number. And the number associated with this is the number 70. As the gematria is called gematria, it has the gematria of 70. Why is that important? Because the number 70 is the number of corporate ascension. It said 70 elders went up on the mountain in Exodus. So it means this is a corporate gateway. Now, people have said to me in the past, because I've been engaged in taking my body into heaven, because I don't see Christians doing that. And after I met Enoch, I realized I could, it was possible to take your body out of earth. And people challenged me on that and said, oh, that's not possible. You can't take your body there. But it is possible because the 70 elders in Exodus actually went up physically with Moses and Aaron, and they ate food there, and they stood on the sapphire stones. So you can stand on the sapphire stones. Your body can stand on the sapphire stones. See, God wants us more than we want him. So ascension is not you persuading God. It's you being persuaded. See, no man can come unless he draws them. The flame of his desire is the fire stones that you walk on. In Eden, you walk on the fire stones to be ascended upwards in his desire. For he's the one that says, come up here. He's the one who says, I want you to be with me where I am. He's the one that says in the Song of Solomon, oh, my dove in the cleft, in the secret place of the stairs, come up so I can see your face, so I can hear your voice. See, Bob Jones, one of Bob Jones' last messages was his time to give daddy a visitation. And we are the generation that's beginning to shift into that reality because I want it all. I want it all. Now, as you begin to lift your eyes to heaven, you begin to move towards heaven. As you step into the flame to recover all, you begin to move. And it says, lift your eyes to the heavens. Set your mind on things above. Look at heaven. Let heaven fill your thoughts. The mirror translation says, relocate yourself mentally. Relocate yourself mentally. What happens when you go up into heaven to your consciousness? It's the next letter. This beautiful letter, Lamed. Wow. This is a good letter to see over someone's head. If you see that over someone's head, you know they're a teacher. 
Lamed means to become the heart that's taught. Lamed is a Hebrew word. It means a heart that understands knowledge. It's the highest reading letter, which means someone that reaches up to a higher consciousness. So what happens to you? You go in the spirit, but your mind starts to expand up beyond what you know. And your heart becomes taught by the Lord. See, I've gone into Zion, and maybe I've not seen anything. I've enjoyed it. I've been there, and I come out, and I know all this information. It's called infused knowledge. Infused knowledge isn't taught. It's absorbed. I have absorbed most of my teachings. Only occasionally am I taught vocally, because vocal is a much lower level than light. You know, sometimes angels have taught me or the cloud of witnesses, but most often they've enveloped me and imparted truth. It's called infused knowledge, and the lamed means you become a house that's taught. The interesting thing is the number 30, which is when Jesus began to manifest the lamed. He began to teach Israel. The symbol for it is a staff, which means you come under the shepherd's rod which means you start to sit in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have no needs. He restores my soul. He prepares a table. My cup overflows. It's overflowing. You're intoxicated. It says he keeps filling my cup. My enemies are watching as I'm feasting. Now goodness and love are following me. You start to have a thing called the law of magnetism. The law of magnetism is where you bend reality so that goodness and love follow you. You're not engaging any mountain to take it. The mountains come to you. See, the reason people are invading mountains and they've got the seven mountain theology is because they're not ascending. Because you have to invade if it's on the earth. If you ascend, it says kings will come to your brightness. It says your sons will come from afar. It says that nations will bring their wealth. See, I've gone up in ascension and I've manifested finances. I've had money appear in my hands that God wanted me to give away. I've had money appear on the bed that I needed for a meal in Melbourne airport. So I've had substance because what happens is in the ascension into union, into his name, this is actually the gateway into his name, In the ascension into his name, the law of magnetism kicks in and it draws towards you. So scientists started getting in touch with me, business people, as I learned to ascend, John Paul Jackson. See, I was invited to John Paul's prophetic council with all the famous prophets. And there were people that for 20 years had worked their butt off trying to get in there. And I'm this goofy guy in Wales that nobody knows about that was trying not to look drunk. I was faking sobriety to blend in. (laughs) Uh, I was trying to blend in, man. They were all there. All the people I loved, I'd read their books. John Sanford, Larry Randolph, Stacey Campbell, Lance Walney. How did I get there? Did I get there by networking through the prophetic movement? (laughs) (laughs) No, I went up in the spirit and I encountered Enoch and Enoch appeared to me in the, like in a form of John Paul Jackson. And when I told the streams ministry head in England, I said, a wind came in the room. That's what happened. And it took him out for half an hour and he had his head on the table. He lifted his head and said, I've heard enough. I thought he was going to tell me to go away. He said, you are going to meet John Paul Jackson. John Paul came to England, and he was doing a conference with like 600 people or something in this Anglican church. And I'm sitting at the back going, oh, no, oh, no, I'm going to meet John Paul for lunch. What am I going to do? We sat down together, and from the moment we met, there was this synergy. We'd been talking for two hours. God's presence was there. But I didn't want to tell him about Enoch looking like him. So I was just not doing it. And the guy, Tony, who would invite me, was saying, do it, do it. And I was like... I, was doing, I knew that the moment I spoke it, I could be a nut bar. I could be like a psycho. And I didn't want to be a psycho for once. I wanted a day off from being a psycho. And then an angel appeared, and I could see the angel, and it, it pointed at John Paul, went, 
When that happens, there's no more discussion. I've learned over the years, you trust. When they point, you go. If they say, you do. So I said, okay, John Paul, I did want to meet you for a reason. I said, this is what happened to me. And when I described what happened, this presence came in the room that was so tangible that the one guy there said, I have to take a photo. He took a photo because he knew this was like something unreal. See, I didn't have to network my way there. That's the law of attraction, the law of magnetism. After I left, John Paul said, the reason I came to England was to meet that guy. And he invited me to the round table with all these famous prophets. Bobby Connor was there and all these other people. And then he, Aaron Evans said, the Lord said, Justin's supposed to preach. <laughs> they gave me like uh, 40 minutes notice. Said, you've got 40 minutes notice to get it together. <laughs> what did I do? I went in the lobby and I went into the name. I went into him where I was completed in love. That though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. Though the prophets may reject me, I am in him. I am complete. I am in the Lamed. I am in Psalm 23. I am in pleasant streams. I am in con constant renewal. I am being intoxicated at the feast of his table. Goodness and love are following me. They can't redefine me. I've already been redefined. They can't appoint me. I've already been appointed in secret in another dimension. And God is looking for, I've got this thing I talk about, mystic house, mystic housewives. I had a dream of a mystic housewife. She was vacuuming, but she was in the spirit. She was in Zion. She was in the glory. She was, and while she was there, cleaning and washing, she was being taught by the Lord. The Lamed was being formed over her house, and she was being taught. And in this dream, it went on for several years. And then one Sunday, she said, Pastor, you've wanted me to share. I've, I want to share today. And they said, we love you, we trust you, we know you, go ahead, this is your day. And she stood up in the dream and she said, for the last seven years, I have been taught the mystic secrets of God. And today, I am permitted to begin to release it over you. And God is raising up mystic housewives. He is raising up ascension people in secret. They've been forged. In secret, they're being created. In secret, they're emerging. They're coming out. They're rising like the dawn. Who are these that appear like the dawn? Who are these mystic housewives? Who are these mystic ones who have been hidden above? See, all you have to do is go in for five minutes and you'll assimilate knowledge. It's a wonder to me that we don't do this. It's a wonder to me that we've remained earth-locked. It's tragic. Woe to those who've stood in the gates and blocked the way. But it's changing now. We know because Isaiah saw it and said, In the last days, many will say, Come, let's go up into the mountain. The last letter we come into is the, Hey! Hey, which as you know is in Yod Hey Vav Hey. And the, the symbol is a person with their arms raised in wonder. So, what is the purpose of ascension? The purpose of ascension is to consume you with love, to cause you to see, to understand, to become a house that is taught by the Lord. So that you're disturbed by his goodness and his love. And this is also the number for the presence. So you come out of that realm carrying the huh, the hey. And you carry the presence. See, I recently, I, I went to, you know that guy from Corn, The guy from Corn, the heavy metal guy? Was Brian. Brian came to see me. I didn't know who he was, and you know, he, and the second time he came, he took me to a corn concert. This was a big mistake. <laughs> Do I look like a heavy metal guy? <laughs> I was so traumatized after two hours there. I crashed my car on the way out of the car park. I reversed, and, and my, my door got stuck on the pillar. And you know, the shape it made was the Death Star. 
I love Star Wars, but I don't want a Death Star on the side of my car, right? So I had to go to the garage. I had to take the car to one location, and there I would be picked up, and they would take me to another location 20, miles, uh, 20 minutes away to pick up a higher car, a rental car. I sat in the car with three, uh, two other guys that would go in there and a woman, and they were talking, and I ascended, and I ascended into the comprehension of the fact that we've got the gospel of life and immortality. So I was sitting in life, and I was looking at the Hebrew letters, and I was just turning it in my consciousness, looking at it. I was getting absorbed, like my spirit was going, oh, oh. But in the natural, I'm just like this. We got to the place. These guys went in front of me. It was an office with, full of people, whatever. And I was so full of the ascension that when they called me forward and I spoke, the spirit came off me and hit the woman behind the till. And she said, who are you? <laughs> and she went, wait, wait. I know who you are. I know who you are. You're a life coach. <laughs> and I said, yes, I am a life coach. I am a life coach. See, I'd been engaged in the spirit of life, and I manifested it through the frequency of my voice. And she said, how does one get a life coach? What I mean is, how do I get you? And she asked me if I'd go back to the car rental thing and do an afternoon seminar with the whole team there of life coaching. See, when it says, now I'll show you a more excellent way, love, love is actually absorption into the divine being because God is love. It's Bible code from you can move in gifts outside of him, outside of union because he's scattered gifts in all of creation. But if you decide, I won't run for it there, I'll go up in him. Then you go into love and the green pastures where it says, I have everything I need. And we come into the hay and the number five is grace, as you know. And have you noticed it's an open house, which means it's always open for you to go deeper into the wonder. You are invited to go into ever-increasing degrees of wonder with God, being disturbed by God, going into the mysteries of God, being reconfigured in God. And you know what? Even time will bend around you. Space will bend around you. Every one of you here has got enough time to do this. <sighs> Shall I keep going? It means... The hay means to return to the breath. It's the the breath. And it says in Revelation, John said, I was in the breath. I was in the hay. He'd already ascended in. This is the interesting thing with ascension. You can go in. And then he said, I heard a voice. And I turned. So he turned in even more. See, the reason we've got a prophetic movement rather than a mystic movement is that we leave the spirit realm when we hear the voice rather than we see the one who spoke. That's the difference between the prophetic and the mystical. Just that one point there is that if John had just functioned in prophecy, he would have heard a voice and come out and spoken, but he turned to see. He was in the hay. He was already in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then what happens? He starts to move through space and time because this, this is the protocol to untether you from being time-locked. You become untethered from space and time and you begin to see it open before you. Ayin, the eye, has the idea that you can see through time and you can understand. All the words in Hebrew to do with time, like days, months, whatever, have all got ayin in it. Ayin means you begin to see rich time, which means you discern times and seasons, but you're not under times and seasons. To be under time and seasons would be to be human, but you're not human. A human being is under times and seasons, but you are seated above every power, every authority, which includes the moon and the sun and the stars, which are called powers, which means they can't define you anymore. 
This is how you see time miracles. I could do a whole talk tonight on time miracles. I have seen crazy, crazy time miracles. I've traveled through time, but I know many people that have because we all bend time. We all do it. It's just he wants to learn, teach us how to redeem time. For the days are evil. So the days are evil because they've collapsed out of Eden because earth's been displaced. So you can't be under the days. You have to untether from them and redeem them, which means the word redeem there is exego rezo, and it means to take the power of. So you're meant to take the power of time to shape reality. What I mean is you've got enough time. This is huge. Man, I've just given you like such a big key. It's something we should all be doing. Okay. Everybody good? Is everybody okay? Is this an okay teaching? I want to propose to you. Okay, let's shift into another thing now. I want to propose to you that what was infrequent will now be normal. See, it was infrequent. We didn't have phones that could talk to each other, went face-to-face time, but now it's normal. The internet's normal. God's looking for those who embody in the spirit what's been given in technology. He's looking for people that don't have a day off. They appear before God in Zion. They walk with angels. They see remote events because as he is, so are you. That's what the Beyond Human book's about. So I want to say this to you, and I'm quoting Rick Joyner. You simply cannot believe we are coming to the last days without understanding there will be a dramatic increase of prophetic revelations and experiences. Because it says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit, and there will be visions, which is a realm, and dreams, which is a nighttime realm, opening up over young and old, which means it's not a youth movement. See, when we reduce it to a youth movement, we've divided what God's brought together. Youth movement, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I will renew the old. I will renew their strength. It doesn't say there's a youth movement. It says there's a movement called all of humanity remembering. All flesh. If we're saying, no, it's a youth movement, we're saying, okay, so the old people are not going to be under that rain that's coming from heaven. And yet in Hebraic mindset, the older you get, the wiser you get. 80 is the number for pay when you become a voice, an oracle. According to the Hebraic culture, you don't know enough until you're 80 to speak. That's why Moses became the pay at 80. Moses began being an oracle, the letter of the oracle pay as the gematria 80. At 80, Moses was ready to step in to become in the voice. And anyway, it says that he'll give you length of days and he'll renew your strength. Moses, when he was 120, had the body of a young man. Scripture says, says his strength hasn't failed, he he could see perfectly. He was so full of life, God had to kill him. And even when he killed him, he still gave him his body back. So it says in Jude that that Satan contended over the body. Why was Satan interested in the body? Why did he want Moses' body? It's a bit creepy, right? What does Satan want with like Moses' dead body? That's a weird verse, right? Well, it's because in the timeline, Moses was supposed to appear on the earth with Elijah to talk to Jesus, which meant he needed a body to interface with this dimension. So Michael protected Moses' body and it was restored back to him and reconfigured so he can appear in the earth. He's one of the ones that's already able to engage here, as well as the ones that were raised when Jesus Jesus was crucified and buried. It said saints from all outside Jerusalem were resurrected. All of those ones are allowed to interface fully in this dimension. The church that is about to rise, Rick Joyner says, the church that is about to rise will be more at home in the heavenly realm than the earthly. True church life, the way it's intended to be, is a supernatural experience. It is life from another realm beyond the earth that brings true life to the earth. See, the neutral ground over the supernatural is over. The whole planet is going supernatural. Marvel movies with trans dimensions and Harry Potter, whatever else, 
You know, when you go out on the streets, people are open, they're hungry, they're going to psychics, new ages. The whole world's gone spiritual except the church. Like, we're afraid, like, don't talk about crystals. Well, you won't like heaven then, because it's got a crystal sea, crystal stones, crystal foundations. He wears crystals, and crystals are a technology. In fact, do you have an iPhone? Yeah, then you have quartz crystals in it. Do you have a quartz watch? Then you're under the government of a crystal when you look at it. This is the hypocrisy we're in. Oils, new age. In the, there's 1,200 verses on oils. Why does it say, anoint them with oil and pray for them? Yeah. If they're going to get healed, why put oil on them? Because oil is a technology that raises the vibrational frequency out of the dimension of sickness. They knew this in Egyptian times, that oils could take you out of the frequency of death. It's all technology. And God wants us to understand the technology. And part of the byproduct of being in ascension is that he reveals to you the mysteries. And you become the ecclesia, the government of God that expresses his desire into creation. You become the voice that speaks from Zion. You become the one that decrees that it's established. See, there's a big difference between prophesying about events that never happen to decreeing things and they're created. So it's not always the devil that's resisting us. It's sometimes just this attitude that what we've got is good enough. It's a false sense of contentment. See, I want to ask you, how content are you? Like, let's say you have a vision of an angel today. Some people are content, and they'll go off a whole year off that. You know, I had one week where I appeared in five people's dreams. In one week, at night, I visited five different people in their dreams and got them drunk. And they woke up and emailed me saying, you came in the dream, prayed for me. We got, I got drunk, and I woke up full of the Spirit. So that week, five people emailed me saying exactly the same thing. I had a, a, a man appear at the door three times, knock and vanish when I went to open the door. Knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> and that week, whilst I was in the utility room, a beam of light, four foot long and very thin slither, opened up visibly and out of that stepped invisible being from heaven and the presence went through the home. That happened in one week. While I was thinking about that week, the Lord said to me, before long, you'll consider that a bad week. You're laughing. That's great because joy is a technology. You know, there's one thing that religion really hates is joy. I, I, the, thing, the number one thing I've been persecuted for is not the cloud of witnesses, none of that. It's joy. Joy triggers demons like crazy. <laughs> Joy is gateway technology. You know when you, when you laugh, God's justice invades your molecular structure and starts to pop the gateways open, and it raises you to a higher consciousness out of the cares and worries of this world. So joy is a technology, and that's why it's so valuable. That's why we need it so much. That's why we should not be unfamiliar with it. Isaac means laughter. The, pro the fruit of believing is Isaac. So we have to become the ecclesia that desire to have it all. We want it all. We want it all. How much of your body do you want to be in the spirit? How much of you do you want to be in the spirit? Because uh, you know, Paul said, I didn't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I, God knows. God knows. God knows. And I want it all. I want to walk on the emerald stones. I want to see. I want to walk with the angels because Jesus loves angels. I want to talk to the angels. I want to be caught up into the council because it says the Lord does nothing. Nothing unless he reveals his counsel to his servants. He is always calling us in because he's a family man. He's an intimate man. And he restricts himself by choice that I won't act until someone's seen what I'm going to do. So until someone participates in it. See, there's councils going on over Canada at the moment. Alberta. There's a council taking place right now about Alberta. Because the Lord has heard the petitions, but he's waiting for someone to ascend, to engage the protocols, to release it into the earth. How do I know that? Because I keep hearing Alberta. When I hear that, it's a call upwards. How do you know when you're called into the courtroom? It's, it moves you. If you feel a pull moved, it means you're invited. 
And many prophecies are not coming to pass right now because people aren't doing the, the heavenly bit that makes it happen. Job is an example of it in scripture. There was a court case and he didn't show up. And his friend says to him, did you stand in the counsel of God? And he has to say, no. And then he says, is there an advocate who can, who can stand on my behalf? And he sees Jesus. He says, I've made my case and I know I'll be vindicated. The whole thing about Job is what I'm talking about today. Who will ascend? See, Job's book would have been completely different if he, if he had descended. Jesus had to come. God had to come at the end and remind him of who he, where he came from. He said, where were you when I laid the foundation to the earth? Because you should know. And he remembered and went back into that council, that position of ascension. And then God gave back double. Ascension brings wealth. Ascension brings prosperity. Ascension brings recalibration. It's a superior reality being planted on the earth through you as the gate for it to happen. Oh, this is why we, I love in the worship here because you've changed the sound. One of the main things that I contend with all over the earth is I contend with people praying for heaven to come down. And praying for God to come. The truth is he has come and heaven's in you. The question is, are you going to engage with it? Are you going to send into Zion? Are you going to be in the realm of the kingdom? Are you going to be in that expanse of the divine essence? Are you going to fuse yourself into union and oneness with him? Because as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So if you think it's distant, it will be distant, but it will contradict Jesus saying, heaven's at hand. So heaven's at hand, but you're framing up that it's over there. This is something the Lord's changing right now. This is why David's appearing all over the earth, because he's restoring the ecstasies. He's restoring the dance trance. He's restoring many voices. He's restoring the authenticity that I have a new song in my heart. I'm in him. I'm one with him. And I'm manifesting life. I'm manifesting joy. I'm manifesting abundance, because I'm not from here. I'm not under the lament. I'm from the place that's full of glory. I'm from the place that's full of life. I'm from the place that's full of light. This is called strengthening yourself in the Lord see we will be false in our ministry to the degree we rely on people as the source of our encouragement true authority comes like David had true authority how because it says David strengthened himself in he knew how to go into yod hey vav hey when his family got stolen and his enemies were up against him and his friends were trying to kill him, his enemies and Saul and everyone was trying to kill him and his wife and kids were kidnapped, it says that David strengthened himself in. That, that is how God can build his throne on David because David represents someone that lives in the name. He can build his ecclesia to the degree that you live in the name. See, when I was at John Paul Jackson's, I can honestly say I didn't need the affirmation. When I went into the lobby, I rang Rachel. I said, I'm going to have to go up on the stage in a minute. And I strengthened myself in the Lord. And I said, they can't add to me. They can't take away from me. They can't define me. I'm in, I'm in, and I will always be in, and I will always be yours, and I am permanently united in the likeness of your risen life. I am permanently one with you. And when I stood up there, I just rested and released Ascension triggers events. Drinking Enoch's wine triggered events. When I drank Enoch's wine, the first group that got in touch with me immediately after that experience was a group. Remember I said that when I drank Enoch's wine, I drank it will be oaks of righteousness. It was an oaky wine. That we will rebuild cities. The first group that invited me in after this experience was a group in Bristol called Love Bristol. And they were rebuilding part of the city. So the... And I didn't even know them. The wine attracted them. See, it's the law of magnetism. I drank that we would rebuild cities. And the first opportunity I had to minister after that was with a group that were rebuilding cities. After I engaged this thing with John Paul Jackson, 
Bob Jones was supposed to speak with Bobby Connor and Patricia King, similar to what happened to you. Bob was ill, so they asked if I would, I would Skype in for his call. I said to Rachel, there's no way I'm going to replace Bob Jones. <laughs> that guy's irreplaceable, man. I said, I'm going to turn them down because I'm not looking for recognition. I cried over that invitation. I cried that God would raise up leaders of the same caliber as Bob and, and John Wimber and great people. I lamented the day John Paul died. I was in America. I went into my hotel. I didn't cry from the, from the same perspective as others. I cried that God would birth leadership, that he would birth people from another world with another heart that would carry us into the future. And I was invited to do this thing with Bob Jones. And I was thinking, I was gutted. I was thinking, how could Bob was still alive, but he'd injured his leg. I was thinking, how could I replace Bob Jones? That really upset me. And the Lord said to me, rebuked me. He said, do you know, Bob was an alcoholic until he was nearly 40. Do you said, how did he get into what he was walking in? How did he stand where he stood? And the Lord said, by grace and grace alone, and by grace alone, you can all stand. See, Bob Jones said something interesting. He said his ceiling would be our floor. I used to think that meant that the level of the prophetic he operated in was the beginning of where we should start. That's a truth. But there was another truth that I later discovered was that where he went in heaven, there's heavens above and that we're being invited even to go in like John, who went into the breath. But it's interesting. He was in an ascension. He sees the seven lamps. He sees Jesus. He's in the heavens. And then he sees a door saying, come up. So how can you go up if you're already up? And do you know an interesting thing? It says, when he went through that door, it says, immediately I was in the spirit. But wasn't he already in the spirit on the Lord's day? Didn't he turn into the spirit? So how many layers of spirit did he go in? <sighs> I've got a little bit more time. I, I want to say this. Is that I think we have to go for the point where you can't tell if you're in the spirit or not. If you can't tell if you're in the spirit, then you're doing good. It means you've blurred the boundary so much you can't tell anymore. Do you know how strong this is getting? There are things happening right now that are completely physical from the realm of the spirit, and you can't tell. So I was in France speaking, and there was this woman that came in, and I could see in the spirit through cardiognosis who she was and the government that she carried. Her name was Christine, and she was a dancer, a beautiful, prophetic woman. She goes all around the world dancing, amazing. She sat in the front, and she had these baggy trousers that were kind of joined in the middle, like Indian kind of combat. And she sat there, and I preached my message, and I kept looking at her. I didn't know her name at the time, and I finished my message. A couple of years later, I was doing a youth conference in France, and they said, there's this woman we want you to meet. She's amazing, Christine. She's a dancer. She walks through the door with her husband, and it's this woman that sat on the floor. And she's wearing the exact clothes that she was wearing. And she came and she said, we've never met. But the Lord spoke to me and said, you've already met me. And to wear these clothes when I come to see you. Listen, we've got to go to a dimension where we're blurring the boundaries, where heaven is at hand. Are you in the spirit? Are you in my body? Am I out of my body? Am I in my body? Am I in the spirit or not in the spirit? Because it's becoming one world. Because we've been praying, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. We go up and heaven comes down. We see them, they see us. We're encompassed by a cloud of witnesses. 2,000 years ago, we bled into one. He's unified the realms. And it's time we start to act like it's already happened. Like it's already a thing, a reality that's already taken place because there are things in that realm that have never been on earth that's supposed to come out the lord said to me i'm going to begin doing in your generation a, a, a sign and a wonder where i'm going to bring things into earth that don't exist here and i was like and, and this is my relationship with the lord i say lord i'd really like a verse for that he said that's easy the rainbow existed around my throne and then i decided to manifest it into the scene he said, in your generation, I'm going to manifest things into the scene. 
that we haven't seen before. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. So we are coming into another world. Rick Joyner says, this is not fantasy. True Christianity is the greatest adventure that anyone can ever have on this earth. Jesus spoke to him, and I will wrap it up now. He said this. Jesus appeared to Rick and said this. They were in heaven. He said, this realm is more real than the earth. But those in your time, but those in your time who break through the fear and the doubt to walk in the power of life here will exhibit the greatest faith. They will be trusted with the greatest authority. You will know the chosen ones by the fire that already burns in them. They will never be content with religious practices, for they yearn for me and the reality of this realm. Because they seek me, I will be found by them. I will give them their heart's desire, my fellowship. I will be their inheritance. I will also give them greater authority than I've yet entrusted to men on the earth. They will receive this because they will have the wisdom and humility to use it. When the day of judgment comes, their testimony will be that they walked with me and their fire did not dim. They are the messengers that the whole of creation has been waiting and travailing for. It is time for them to awaken.